If you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn to Haggai and chapter 2. Um, we're going to do an overview of the book of Haggai. I won't um, be able to answer every single question that you have, and we will not be able to touch on every single verse, but we'll, we'll do an overview of Haggai. Um, and I want to read chapter 2, 1 through 9. Um, I'll read Haggai 2, 1 through 9, and then um, I'll read it, pray, and we'll get into it. So this is Haggai 2, starting at verse 1. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through it. Thank you that through your word that you give hope and encouragement today as you did through the prophet Haggai in Haggai's day. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to behold your beauty, to behold your glory, that we would be transformed as we hear from you. Make us more like your son, Jesus. Give us hope. Help me to speak your word. Help me to be faithful to your word and to speak the truths of your word and not go beyond it. Pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. A week ago, my family and I, we went on vacation to Bass Lake. It's a tradition of ours to go up every 4th of July week or weekend with my wife's side of the family. And obviously this year was a bit different because of the pandemic, but overall it was really, really great. And in all honesty, it was probably one of my more favorite trips that we have made to the lake since my daughters have been born. I have two girls. And this, this was the first year where our oldest daughter, she's three and a half, was able to swim on her own. She was able to float in the water and we, we weren't constantly afraid if if she would fall in and we weren't afraid of what would happen to her. We were confident in her abilities. So on this trip, I came to the realization that the money and the time that my wife and I put in towards swim lessons were, were actually paying off. But that's not how I always felt about swim lessons. A few years back, my wife um, really wanted our daughter to be in swim school, to take lessons so she knows how to swim and so that she can be safe. I was against it because I didn't want to pay for it. But eventually my wife convinced me of its value, so we, so we did it. And um, there was this one day where actually I had the opportunity to watch my daughter swim. I went to swim lessons, I went to the swim school, and I was extremely disappointed. I could not believe that I was paying money for this. First of all, the lesson, it only lasts 15 minutes. And for the first handful of lessons, all my daughter was doing was just crying. 
And all that her swim instructor was doing was holding her in the water as she's crying. That's what I was paying money for. And I was so disappointed. I was so frustrated. I could not believe that this is something I was paying for. I could not see the end goal. I wanted immediate results. And I found myself disappointed. In the book of Haggai, the people of God are disappointed. Like me with my daughter's swim lesson, they had some different expectations of what life would look like after they returned from exile. Yet things weren't what they expected. They lost hope. It seemed as if the glory days were behind them and not in front of them. Yet God, in His grace and His mercy, He does not let His people remain there. He does not let them stay there. Our big idea, our main point for this morning is this. When circumstances seem bleak and are not what they once were, remain on mission, for God is with you, God is with us, and is faithful to keep His promises. When circumstances seem bleak and they're not as good as they once were, remain on mission, for God is with you and he is faithful to keep his promises. Our message this morning is going to be divided into four sections. We're going to talk about the command to build God's house, the futility of building our own house, the significance of God's house, and lastly, the king who will rule in God's house. So first, we're going to look at the command to build God's house. But before we dive into the command, I want to give us some historical context. God's people have been sent into exile due to their sins. God made it clear in Deuteronomy 28 that this would happen if they strayed from his ways. If they did not obey him, exile was going to be part of their future. It was part of the Mosaic Covenant that God made with his people Israel. So by 586 BC, Jerusalem has fallen and the temple is destroyed. Things look bleak for the people of God. It seemed as if God has abandoned them. It looked as if the promises of God were no longer intact. But then there's a glimmer of hope in 536 BC, where King Cyrus decrees that a small number of Jews were able to go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple of God. And as you can imagine, there's probably just great excitement and great joy on the, on the part of the people. They're able to go back into their land, finally, and they get to work on rebuilding the temple of God. Yet it didn't take long for them to encounter some opposition, which would eventually lead them to stop the work of rebuilding the temple. So the people of God had been in the land for over 16 years when Haggai's prophecy comes to them. For years, for 16 years, they have neglected the work of the Lord. And so God, what he does is he uses Haggai, his prophet, to convict his people of their sin and to move them into action. This command to rebuild the temple is at the center of Haggai's prophecies. The command to rebuild the temple is the main theme of the book of Haggai. But before we look at why rebuilding the temple is so significant to God, I want us to look at why the people of God neglected this great work. Look with me in chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Verse 3 says, Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. 
And he who earns wages does so to put into a bag with holes. In these first few verses, we see that the people of God were more concerned with their homes, with their needs, and their comforts than in the things of God. So what God does here is he intervenes. He intervenes to rebuke his people. Again, he says in verse 3, Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? And it's not that these people were wealthy. They were actually experiencing some financial difficulty. We see this in verses 5 and 6. Verse 6 says, And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. These people, they weren't abounding in savings. They weren't living in luxury, but they they had enough to work on their homes and to make it comfortable for them. So God comes to them through his prophet Haggai to convict them and to move them towards the work of the Lord in rebuilding the temple. And one of the ways that God does this through Haggai is he reveals to them the futility of building their own house. Or to put it more simply, the futility of living for ourselves and putting our interests above the interests of God. Look with me in verse 6 again. He says, You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. Living for our own glory and our own interests will always, always lead to disappointment. And this is exactly what's happening in Haggai. Rather than focusing on the things of God, they were focused on self. They kept working and sowing, but not making enough and not reaping enough. It was an exercise in futility. They were working harder than ever, but not getting the results that they want. Does that sound familiar? I mean, how much of that do we see in our own world and in our own culture? And if we're honest, how much of that do we see even in our own hearts. You work and you strive so hard to get what you truly want, but you never get there. Or maybe some of you, you actually reach your goals, but when you get there, you realize it's not what you hoped for. So you move on to the next thing, thinking that fulfillment will be found there. But when God is not our highest priority and he is not our greatest treasure, we will continue to strive and strive and strive after the wrong things, thinking that they are going to satisfy us. But in reality, they will leave us empty. They'll leave us hungrier and thirstier. Living for ourselves will always end in in disappointment. You will eat but never have enough. You will drink, but never have your fill. You will clothe yourselves, but never be warm. Now I want to turn our attention to the significance of God's house. We just looked at the command to build God's house, the futility of building our own house, and now we're going to look at the significance of God's house. Why did God want his people to rebuild the temple? Why was it so important to him? And we get an answer here in verse 8 of chapter 1. God says, Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. See, the temple was the place where God in his glory dwelt. And obviously, God cannot be contained to a place, to a single location, But the temple was the place where God in his grace chose to dwell and make his presence known to his people in a special way. It was the place where God had chosen to dwell with the people that he has chosen, and it was a place for them to be with him and to worship him. The temple marked 
a special relationship God had with his people. It was a visible sign of the covenant that God made with them, that he would be their God and that they would be his people. So maybe now you can understand a little bit why God was so displeased at his people's lack of urgency in rebuilding the temple. It showed their lack of desire for him. His presence was not a priority for them. They were more concerned with building their own house and making life comfortable for them while God's house laid in ruins. It showed that they were content without him. Or maybe they just believed that God had abandoned them, so they might as well take care of themselves. But through the conviction of the Spirit, the people are moved to repentance and they obey God by rebuilding the temple. But a month later, they run into another problem. Look with me in verse 3 of chapter 2. It says, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? As they got to work, they realized something. They realized that this temple is nothing, like the, is nothing like the temple that Solomon built in its physical beauty. They're discouraged, and rightfully so. Everything about this return to Jerusalem was not as good as they had hoped. They believed God was going to restore the kingdom, yet at every single turn, they are met with disappointment. And I'm sure in this unique season that we all find ourselves in, that we can relate with the people of God. I remember when we first went into quarantine, our staff and our church and the people in our church, we were, we were looking forward to the day when we would all be back together. And we talked about how it might be even better. People are going to be excited because they haven't been in church for a, for a while, that we're going to pray more fervently, that we're going to sing louder, that our services were going to be packed. And we talked about how maybe Easter Sunday would be the day that we would be able to gather again. And we talked about how we were going to have a party afterwards, we were going to have food trucks, and it was just going to be awesome. But obviously with all the restrictions that have been put in place, that's just not the way things went. And that's not even the way things are going even today. We have social distancing, people are wearing masks. Church, the way that we are used to, is not going to be normal for a long time. It will look very different. And, and there's no light at the end of the tunnel right now. And I know for me personally, at the beginning of this, I had really big hopes that the Lord was going to do something incredible. I remember reminding people in our church, reminding friends, and even reminding myself, speaking these truths into my heart, saying that it's times like this where the Lord is at work. But as we're in this longer, and I see just the craziness of our, of our world, the divide the division that's in our culture, in our world, in our country, not just even in our country, but even within the church, I can start to lose hope. I can start thinking and believing, will we ever recover from this? And this is what the people of God, they're feeling. Their, their excitement has, has died down. Things are not as good as they once were. And it's in this context where God, through his prophet Haggai, speaks encouragement. In verses 4 and 5 of chapter 2, he assures them of his presence. And in verse 9, speaking of the temple, he says, The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. What God is saying here is that the final glory of the temple will be greater than in Solomon's day. See, the temple was not the goal. 
The temple was merely a shell of something greater and better, the glory of God, the presence of God. See, the glory of God is what makes the temple glorious. It's his presence that fills the temple that makes it special. So God is saying, yes, things may seem bleak. Yes, things may not seem as good as they once were. But the best is yet to come. The glory days are not behind you, but in front of you. God is letting his people know that he has not abandoned his promises. That he will restore all things. That Ezekiel's vision of the glory of God departing from the temple is not the end of the story. The glory of God will return. God says, I will fill this house with glory. Last Christmas, my wife and I, we bought um, our daughters some magnet tiles. And if you don't know what magnet tiles are, think of Legos, except they're magnetic tiles. You can build stuff with it. And it was one of those toys where not only did our kids enjoy it, but it was a toy that mom and dad got to enjoy. We actually enjoyed building these things. And one day, um, my daughter, she asked if I could build her what was on the cover of the box of her toys. And I said, sure, let's do it. So I started building this thing, and I'm getting excited. I, I'm actually really enjoying building this thing. I'm impressed with what I'm making. So much so, when I was done, I actually took a picture of it to save it. I was very excited. But as I'm building this thing, my daughter likes to destroy what I built. She's making it hard for me to build and to keep it standing up. And I'm starting to get irritated with my daughter. I'm telling her to stop bothering me, to stop touching the toy. And it's in that moment where I come to this realization of why I'm doing this in the first place. The goal was not to build something amazing. The goal was not to um, make something that I'm proud of. The goal was to spend time with my daughter. The goal was to enjoy her presence. God says to the people of God, don't worry if the temple is not what it once was. I am with you. That's the goal. And he says, I will continue to be with you. I will fill this house with glory. And the way God accomplishes this, it's, it's mind-blowing. No longer will the glory of God dwell in a tabernacle or a building, but in a person. Colossians 1, 19 says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In the person of Jesus Christ, God has drawn near to us. He took on the frailty of human flesh to be with us. He walked among His creation. He could be touched and be seen with the human eye. And that is far better and far greater than a building. God came to be with us. Jesus is the true and better and greater temple. And this is why Jesus in John 2, 19 says, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And it says that he was speaking about his own body. Jesus is the very presence of God. He is God, which was the goal of the temple. And not only is he the presence of God, but he's also the one who made the once and for all sacrifice for sins in his death on the cross so that we may have peace with God. No longer do we have to go to a physical temple to make sacrifice for sins. We have direct access to the Father through Christ. We can have forgiveness of sins by going directly to Jesus. So yes, in our day, things may seem bleak. 
And maybe for some of us, we're having a hard time seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. But God is at work. Be encouraged. God has not abandoned us. He will keep his promises to us. He's up to something. I love what John Piper says. He says, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, and you may be aware of three of them. So keep working. For God is with you. Your work is not done in vain. So what is, it the, what is the work that we are now called to? It's to build the temple. Not the physical temple, but the spiritual temple. Ephesians 2, 21 through 22 says, In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now that Jesus has ascended to the right hand of the Father and is seated there, the Bible says that we are the temple of God. We are the dwelling place of God. We are the ones who get to make God's presence known to the world. And we are the ones through whom people can experience peace as we preach the gospel to them, and they come to believe. So how do we build up the temple? First, we preach the gospel. Like the people in Haggai's day, Jesus also promised us his presence as we go and make disciples. That's our mission. That's what we have been called to. But maybe if you're like me, You can relate to the people in Haggai's day. We've lost some focus. Maybe the pandemic and the quarantine has given us excuses to neglect this aspect of building up the church. Yet God has this exact same message for us. Work, for I am with you. Secondly, we can build up the church by building up the body of Christ. In order for the spiritual temple of God to grow, we need one another. We, we need to support one another and care for one another. God has given each and every person who is a believer in Christ a spiritual gift to be used for the good of others. We all have spiritual gifts and we are to use them even in a season like this. I would say maybe even more in a season like this. We are called to speak the truths of the gospel to each other, to disciple one another, to be in community with one another. That is how we build up the body of Christ. We cannot do that on our own. So don't turn inward like the people in Haggai's day did. Keep building one another up. Call each other. Encourage each other. For God is with you. So we've looked at the command, the futility of building our own house, and the significance of God's house. Now I want to turn our attention to the king who will rule in God's house. And as I mentioned earlier, in the book of Haggai, the people of God are disappointed. They had high hopes for coming back to Jerusalem. Yet things were not as good as they had hoped. For one, the temple was not as impressive as they would have liked. And secondly, they were without a king. The temple and king were important markers, important pillars for the people of God, for the nation of Israel. And in the previous section, God addresses the question of a temple. And now here, at the end of chapter 2 and at the end of the book of Haggai, he addresses the question of a king. Look with me in chapter 23 of chapter 2. It says, On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. In order for us to understand what's going on here, we need some context. King Jehoiachin was one of the last kings of Judah 
before they went into exile. And he was an evil king. So much so that this is what the Lord had to say to him in Jeremiah 22, 24. As I live, declares the Lord, through Jehoiachin, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet ring on my right hand, yet I would tear you off. A signet ring was a symbol. It was a symbol of authority and authenticity. So for example, a, a royal document would not be considered authentic or legitimate unless it was stamped with the king's seal or signet ring. So essentially what God was saying to Jehoiachin was, you've lost your status as the king of my people. You're no longer mine. And as a result of this, the people of God were without a king for a while. They didn't have one in exile. They've returned and they still have no king. So many of the people of God, they're probably thinking, has God abandoned his promise to David in 2 Samuel 7? Where he told David that he would have a son on his throne forever? They're thinking, have we sinned so much that God has given up on that promise? Has God given up on us? And God reassures them that that's not the case. God always keeps his promises. Not even our sins can mess that up. Not even our sins can cancel out the promises of God. So to make this point explicit, God chooses Zerubbabel, a descendant of David, and the language of a signet ring. He's revealing to his people that he has not forgotten them nor has he abandoned his promises to David. And like the temple, it's not going to be fulfilled immediately, but it will be fulfilled in the coming of Jesus, another son of David, who will eternally sit on David's throne. Can you imagine how encouraging this would have been for the people of God to hear? Their sins did not cancel out the promises of God. Their sins did not cause God to abandon His promises. What a reassuring reminder. And this, and this is even truer for us. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, God will never, He will never cast you out. He will never get tired of you. And he will never give up on you. God will never change his mind about you. There is not coming a day way off into the future where you've sinned so much where God says, I'm done, I'm out. That day is not coming. He will not give up on you. Your sins were not a barrier for his promises to be fulfilled. In fact, your sins were the very reason Jesus Christ, the son of Zerubbabel, came to us in the first place. Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for you when you hated him. Christ died for you when you were his enemy. Christ died for you when you were indulging in sin. Why would he leave you now that you are his? Now when you belong to him. Dane Ortland says, With Christ, our sins and weaknesses are the very resume items that qualify us to approach him. Nothing but coming to him is required, first at conversion, and a thousand times thereafter until we are with him upon death. Christ came to save sinners. When he went to the cross to pay for your sins, he knew exactly what he was purchasing. He knew exactly what he was getting himself into. And there has not been a day 
that he has regretted it. He does not have buyer's remorse. He does not regret it. And that's the greatest news in the world. And anyone can get in on it. Any person can get in on it by faith in Jesus, by believing that he is the Son of God who lived the perfect life that we could not live, who died the death that we deserve, and then rose from the dead to give us new life by believing in that message. Anyone can have that promise that he is for us, that he will never cast us out. It's the greatest news in the world. I want to close our time with two questions. The first is, where are your priorities? What are some misplaced priorities in your life? The people of God in Haggai's day, they turned inward. They were too focused on self, and it only led to greater disappointment. It is only when Christ is our highest priority and he is our greatest treasure that we get to enjoy the things of life as they were intended to. Why? Because we are no longer trying to make creation do something that it was never intended to do, to satisfy us completely. It was not intended to do that. Only Christ was. So when Christ is our greatest treasure, we can enjoy everything else rightly. I love what C.S. Lewis says, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. Secondly, what aspects of the Lord's work are you neglecting? In, in Haggai's day, the people of God, they stopped working because they felt like it was in vain. They felt like it was for no purpose. They believed that things were not going to get any better, so it was useless to do any work. And maybe some of us, we find ourselves there. Maybe you look at our world, you watch the news, you look at our culture, and you think this is an uphill battle that we will not win. But God says, take heart, for he is at work and he is with us, and he will fulfill his promises. This is not the end. God is doing so many things that we cannot see, and one day we will be able to see it all. And there is coming a day when we will be with him, when we will be reunited with him, and all things will make sense. All the nations will be subjected to him. He would be king, ruling, and everything will be made right. That's our hope. So we trust in him and we work hard in getting the message of the gospel out and to build up the body of Christ as we wait for his return. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you speak into our lives and you give encouragement to us even though this was written such a long time ago and I just pray Father that you would be with us that you would be with Carson Bible Church that this would be a place where we seek after you where we don't get bothered and distracted but what, by what our physical eyes can see but we take heart, we hope, knowing that you are at work. You will keep your promises. Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus Christ on our behalf. Thank you that because of him, we can have peace with you. That we can have forgiveness of sins. That we can have new life. Father, thank you for the ways that you daily take care of us. And I just pray, God, that you would just transform us daily, that we would become more like you, and that we would help each other in that process. We love you. It's in your sons that we pray.